and then most importantly for us, failure to recognise warning signs in pregnancy and labour and in newborn babies. Um, We've also got data from the ICNARC report, and you may not know what that is. Uh, that's morbidity data that the intensivists use, and they've got a thing called Case Mix Programme, which in every intensive care up and down the country, they have auditors that enter data, and it gets them money. It's called payment by results. And in the last, um, since 2009, ICNARC, which stands for the Intensive Care National Audit, has taken obstetric data. And we know that um, it, we've got 7,000 patients in this data set, 7,000 intensive care HDU type patients, which comes to 2.9 per thousand maternities. So it's not an insignificant number. And the, the intensivists kind of sit up when we tell them, tell them these, these figures, because I don't think people realise how many mums do need care. The CE Confidential Inquiry, or the new KNS, I'll tell you a bit more about shortly, um, they showed in sepsis it was 4.7 times 10,000 of, of 10,000 maternity. Things like um, sepsis, even before the report was released, there was an emergent theme brief and there were so many national guidelines, robust protocols, th stuff like that in place. And you could see that sepsis then fell to the third cause of maternal mortality in the most recent report. So, I mean, coming to the next topic. So, if we take one step uh, forwards and have a look, what about morbidity? For every one woman who dies, there are nearly 100 to 120 women who are seriously ill and who, are, who probably could have died. And the, the problem with um, maternal morbidity is it's difficult to quantify. In fact, uh, this report, I had read it only a few weeks ago and it was quite an eye-opener. In fact, what the report contains is quite as shocking as the title itself. And this is a global perspective of maternal morbidity. If we are referring to somebody who's had pulmonary edema after preeclampsia as maternal Does morbidity. Make their oxygen dissociation curve and the haemoglobin holding onto the oxygen and act in different ways. And it's to do with whether you've got a lot of acid in the body for your hydrogen ion to go up and, and temperature and it shifts the curve up, makes it, makes it uh, act differently with oxygen. So there's lots of different states. But just remember that the haemoglobin has an effect and that's why when you get to sats of 90, it's bad news and don't go there. So as I say, there's acid base, we call, we call it hemostasis and that's like, um, like the balance of acid base in the body. And the lungs and the kidneys are the two major areas that uh, are important in, in metabolism. Um, the haemoglobin, uh, protein and phosphate, we talk about buffers and they're just things that collect acid. And the haemoglobin is a big, uh, uh, intracellularly, haemoglobin takes acid, proteins and phosphate. And then in, outside the cells, it's proteins and bicarbonate. You, I'm sure you've heard of bicarbonate. And that's, that's why when we do acid base and acid gases, we have to have all these other things in. Our, uh, muse charts. Okay. Are you happy with those results? Do you want to do anything? Oh, now then. We haven't treated blood pressure yet, have we? Yeah, so again, along with looking in the eyes, a catheter is quite a stimulating event and can make them fit. So um, I wouldn't put that in until I've stabilised the blood pressure. I know she's not going to be peeing. Am I worried about that at the minute? No, I'm not. I'm worried about her blood pressure. MAP's still 133. That's just to remind you. Okay. Um, Oh, my title shrunk. So we need some um, we need some blood pressure management here, don't we? And the, the times that you think about that, absolutely, if you've got severe hypertensions, and that's the 160 over 110, and we're aiming really for a systolic of 150 or less, and a, a diastolic of between 80 and 100, okay? And we have various things at our disposal. So if I'd have been rung about this lady on MAU, I'd have said, quickly chuck a 200 milligram Lebetalol tablet at her. But once you that have a new onset of confusion and then drop down further. So in terms of assessment then, <coughs> we go back to our ABCD assessment basically, because there's no point as moving on um, to D if we haven't um, protected the airway. And quite often as well, as we've, when we talked about the causes, there's a lot of causes within ABC that can have an impact on D. So your hypoxic patients, your patients that have got hy hypercapnia. Um, so maybe you might have patients that come in with asthma, that maybe have had an asthma attack and might have a bit of a high carbon dioxide level and a bit hypoxic, might have an impact on their conscious level. Circulation. Um, so you need to do them before you can actually move on to D. Then when you actually get to your D part of your assessment, 
initially you're going to be doing Avpo? Patients needs, not our availability and our suitability. Actually for us to walk to wherever the patient was sick and deliver that care. And that's not just between in our hospital but we have networks between critical care units in in other areas so there's a north of england critical care network and we liaise with them regularly in terms of facilitating bed delivery to patients who need it in a timely manner clearly this had an impact because most people were used to working in a very um, supervised environment and in terms of delivery of workforce to the places where we need to be so if a critically in patient is in room eight I know you have your midwifery staff, but who else is going to go out and do that? And that was a big impact upon medical training and also upon nurse training. And this is where critical care outreach came to kind of bridge the gap, to make sure that patients were safe irrespective of their location. And it's something and review that we review failure to rescue cases and look back through RCAs from serious untoward incidents. And the common things are that Many patients have several reviews 48 hours prior to the cardiac arrest, but no evidence of escalation to seniors. Was there a clear documented physiological monitoring plan? Not always. Was the corrected escalation response enacted after a trigger? And did the patient receive appropriate treatment? Did the patient improve? So these are the aspects that are being looked at. A lot of the failure to rescue data looks at measuring cardiac arrest rates and looking at untreated, un, sorry, unrecognised or untreated deterioration or failure to recognise or deal appropriately with end of life circumstances or life limiting disease. So should, these, should patients be getting the call at all? Um, well, I mean, it, gets, it gets worse now. Thankfully she's okay um, and I did make contact with the hospital and they didn't have um, a screening tool in place and everything, and they've took our screening tool. Um, you know, and we've took the positives from it, um, but, you know, it's just to tell, you know, their story. She works in a gym, he's a builder. You know, they know, they know the word sepsis because of me, but, you know, it's purely their story. It's like, we're quite scared of the word, though, aren't mm. we? Like, when she said, have I got sepsis? Yeah. yeah. Like, the midwife didn't want to say yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. as if it's a really scary word. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you've got a blood infection, you've got sepsis. It just it doesn't change. It just sounds scary, doesn't it? So it people does. try and avoid it. And that's a lot of the education we do across the wards here. Um, you know, we say, please tell them it's sepsis, but you will always get somebody saying, Oh, don't worry, your grandma's just got a urine infection. No, she hasn't, she's got sepsis, and until we say it, the public won't recognise it. And the I think, well, I know that I had several um, failed um, attempts off the ventilator, I can't get my words out. I had, as Jackie explained, I had several chest infections which tend to um, develop into sepsis, uh, antibiotics. Um, another complication was I kept getting pneumothoraxes. Um, I had about, well, I've got 12 scars, but I had more than that, and they just kept blowing, and the more pressures I put on, the more pneumothoraxes I got. In fact, they actually set up a tray at the end of my bed because I had that many at one point. <laughs> um, but as a consequence of all that, being in ITU for three months, um, I suffered from extreme muscle disuse um, and I had stiffness in my joints. Um, and that was all because of, I was immobile for such a long period of time. I suffered with real bad soldier pain. I couldn't walk, couldn't stand up. Uh, I had no coordination, couldn't hold a pen. Couldn't lift my, at one point I couldn't lift my head off a pillow. But. Potential risk and complications with virtually anything we do. But the significant ones, the ones that can affect mor morbidity and mortality, um, I will pick out. Okay, obviously as we move towards regional anaesthesia, that is where we start to have you know, the, uh, the, the, the input of the anaesthetist. And that's where obviously our expertise lies, but that's also where some of the more significant problems can occur. Entonox I've tacked on the end, I won't be talking about that. First thing I need to talk about is opioid use. Um, overdosage. It's difficult to overdose a pregnant woman, and I was pondering about how and it could happen, and that was the sort of list I came up with. That you either prescribe it wrong, or it's given wrong. You know, you give the wrong amount. 
you know, certainly in theatres, we have 60 milligram vials of morphine that if you don't pay attention to and you think it's a 10 milligram vial, you could quite happily give someone 60 milligrams. Complicated you know. problems of uh, people with previous heart surgery with mechanical valves, etc. But the absolute numbers of them you'll see are actually quite small. So in terms of who should get reviewed by somebody who is expert in inverted commas, by which I mean a cardiologist with some interest in this, it should really be anybody who is known to have pre-existing heart disease to err on the safe side, or indeed anybody who you happen to notice has a sternotomy or thoracotomy scar, because if they've got a scar in their chest and they can't give you chapter and verse on why they've got that, you really want to dig deep to find out more about it. And if nothing else, it's worth remembering that lesson, because you'll see more and more of these women uh, who have often had quite complex problems but can't tell you much about it. <clears throat> so in terms of acquired heart disease, I don't have an awful lot on this because we don't know much about it. It is an increasing problem. We are seeing women who have had heart attacks. Blood returning to the heart, um, which leads to a fall in preload and cardiac output. And this can actually be severe enough for the mother to lose consciousness if she's laid supine. Um, and then the aorta, when it's compressed, um, it, the main problems it causes are, firstly, it reduces the um, blood flow to the placenta, so it's um, clearly not good for the fetus. And also the maternal renal blood flow is... Um, markedly reduced. Um, so the, the fetal transplacental gas exchange would be compromised. Um, so this is why the left lateral tilt is always done when we need to lay a lady supine. And um, general anaesthetic and spines are... Place that, uh, was published that year. <laughs> there was quite a bit written about early warning scoring systems. And they specifically uh, gave this example, which was uh, from Scotland, and held this up as a, uh, as a model that people could aspire to. And then not much was said until this document came out in 2011, and um, Audrey was one of the authors. There we go. More examples were given. Uh, one from Liverpool, one from Shrewsbury and Telford. And they all look very familiar, and this, of course, resembles the, the chart that you'll all be familiar with from this hospital. Um, and this, I've just put this up, this just reminds us of the, the, the flow of information that should happen in a good early warning scoring system. So you can have non-clinical staff doing the first bit, the measuring of blood pressure, measuring of heart rate, that's fine. Uh, and then somebody with some degree of, of knowledge and skill has to... Back again. So... Thinking about respiratory changes, um, you get an increase in your respiratory rate and an increase in oxygen consumption. Um, the increased respiratory rate leads to a decrease in um, your arterial carbon dioxide levels and you have a decreased ability to buffer and an increased susceptibility to acidosis. Um, you can see from the diagram there, the lungs are pushed up by the um, expanding uterus and the intra-abdominal contents so you you're re reducing your to think about it, simply reducing your reservoir of oxygen um, so at the same time as your body's using up more oxygen your ability to store oxygen I in your lungs is is reduced so that uh, if if you stop breathing for any reason um, your time to hypoxia is is, re is reduced and then if you hear about people talk about hypotonic solutions and hypertonic solutions, they're referring to sort of what is normal for plasma. And osmolality is tightly controlled and water will move across these cell membranes so to try and balance osmolality throughout the whole body. And as I say, water will move to try and minimise changes in osmolality. So if you would, well, come on, talk about that again later. If we move a bit onto fluid intake at the moment, the recommended intake for a man is about two and a half litres, a woman slightly less. 80% of that 
we get from fluid that we drink, water, tea, coffee, 20% of it comes from food. And your body can produce an additional up to about 10% of water from metabolism. So, educationary hypo management and perhaps the use of insulin pumps or continuous glucose monitoring um, should be indicated in women who are particularly at risk. These are two graphs which have come from that particular paper and in figure one what this shows is the number of hypoglycemic uh, events per week during pregnancy in 108 of, of these Danish women and you can see that there is a clustering in the uh, first half of the pregnancy, particularly in the first trimester. And this is the frequency distribution of hypos per individual woman. And you can see that although most had only one event, there are a number in whom a lot of events take place. So it is linked to uh, 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 a specific number of individuals. Now the problem with hypoglycemia is that Everybody does a Captain Mannering and starts to panic when a woman gets hypoglycemia. Okay? And it's really important. The first thing is, is measuring kidney function. You don't want to be going around doing 24-hour creatinine clearance. It's a pain in the ass. It's messy. It's inaccurate. The women don't collect it properly. It's difficult. So you stick to your serum creatinine. That's all you need to do, okay? Nothing fancy. Just stick to your serum creatinine. And the magic number, if you like, is 120. And we'll come back to this in a bit, why that's the magic number. But women who have a serum creatinine and it's greater than 120 at conception, they're in a high-risk group automatically, okay? Most young women of childbearing age will have, a, with normal renal function, will have creatinines about 60 or 70, even 40 or 50. And we have pregnant, pregnant women where we check renal function and their serum creatinine is about 30 or 40. So what would many people would consider as a normal serum creatinine in this lab, that's about the upper limit of normal. That's actually really, yeah, really... Too much um, on the, the, the clotting test because you will find that they can lead you astray a bit. So in pregnancy, as I say, we are, you know, women are pro-thrombotic and that's to protect against bleeding. So you get a rise in factor VIII levels, rising fibrinogen levels, a rise in the von Willebrand factor and protein C levels and a reduction in protein S levels. And you also get um, reduced fibrinolytic activity, so the idea is that you hang on to your clot longer. Um, so things like PI1 and TAFI um, are increased and your plasminogen uh, and uh, tissue activation factor are reduced. Now, um, TEG or thromboelastography has become the kind of in and fashionable way to look at coagulation has the advantage that you can do it as a near patient test and it's very rapid um, and basically if you haven't seen it um, this little sort of thing um, turns around and, and it's the time it takes that antibodies to again a crucial issue uh, in these people presence of anti rho and anti la antibodies whether they are there or not and that makes an important part as you'll see and then we'll just talk a little bit on neonatal lupus not particularly that great deal so pregnancy in lupus, now about 60% of diff uh, pregnancies can cause a flare-up of lupus, really. So disease activity, flare-ups can occur up to in 60% of pregnancies, and they're very difficult to diagnose a lot of times because things like hair loss, skin rashes, a bit of proteinuria, a bit of renal impairment, uh, arthropathy, joint pains, all these features, fatigue, all these pa are part of normal pregnancy as well, or somebody's co developing some pregnancy-related complications rather than underlying, underlying connective tissue disorder. So it becomes very, very difficult, and you can't also predict who is going to develop that. That's the difficult bit as well. Uh, when we look at the lupus, the, uh, the Kama staff from uh, London basically published this paper looking at uh, the risk factors for poor outcome in people who have had lupus. And what they found was pulmonary hypertension, presence of chronic kidney disease. A lad called Wayne Jowlett ran in Nottingham again last millennium. They decided they would change the connectors on spinal needles. It took a huge amount of work to make sure you couldn't put a syringe of any old stuff on the end of a spinal needle and inject it in. Okay? You can still take a giving set, any old stuff, in 2015 and connect it to an epidural. And it happens regularly. Okay, why? Why have we allowed that to happen? It still happens. These are ones, these are real examples from the National, obviously they 
not taking the pictures at the time, they've mocked them up with mannequins. That's a baby's tracheostomy and someone stuck an NG feeding tube in the end of it because you could connect it. That guy's got up, gone to the toilet, disconnected his blood pressure cuff, come back and someone's disconnected his blood pressure cuff to his IV line. Oh Effect, <laughs> air embolus, dead. It does say on the bottom, do not do this. The situation is not ideal, they don't have all the equipment they could possibly need and they don't have as many team members as you will have in the A&E department. The handover at, a, at a, the primary survey is absolutely crucial. And a common error that you'll see when major trauma patients are managed is that everyone is so keen to do something for the patient that they will dive in before the handover is completed. The problem with that is that this is the only opportunity you've got to gain the information from the people who've been out on the ground and seen what happened. For this reason, you need to have a, a pause while you listen to the handover and try and absorb the information, and b, a systematic process of handing the o information over. Now there are a multitude of different systems and wherever you work they will follow their own pattern. But just to give you an example of one with which I'm familiar, the AtMIST system is just gives you the age of the patient, the time they were injured, the mechanism of injury, 